Welcome, everybody. This is week 14th. This is it. This is the very last week um, in which we will be discussing the topics from the textbook. Next week will be a general review in preparation for the final exam. But today we will continue the second part of chapter seven, philosophy as a basic approach toward neuroscience, toward an understanding of the mind-body connection. Uh, it's also one of my favorite chapters because it's a conclusion, not a conclusion in a sense of the very final words on the mind-body connection, but a conclusion as in opening up new perspectives, adding questions, in fact, adding interpretation to the mind-body problem. And we will see whether adding interpretation, the very act of opening new doors, will actually help us clarify how mind and body are indeed connected. Uh, this will also contain uh, some more um, theoretical as well as clinical pragmatical approaches to uh, the subfields of neuroscience, so neuroheuristics, neuristics, artificial intelligence, and we will continue to the meaning of life, I dare to say, sense, purpose, and meaning. And I hope that with this lecture, uh, students will go home with a much more profound, but also a broader understanding on the things that make us human, how wonderful it is to discover our true nature and how neuroscience, philosophy, and all the fields that we discuss this semester help us getting a much clearer picture of what it means to understand our brain, our mind, our self, and our soul. Without further ado, let's begin with week 14. So since I've been talking a lot, uh, let's talk about neurolinguistics here. Uh, what does neurolinguistics study? Well, it, since the name involves linguistics, language, of course, um, structure of language, form, mutations, and changes, as well as the context at large, the history, the development, and environment that sense or meaning creating effects on the form and the use of language. Now, um, to be fair, this might in itself have some ethnocentric Western empirical bias. Um, that so that the scientific assumption that all the processes involved in, in, in neurolinguistics have a natural origin rather than a divine revelation, which is contrary to what we said earlier as a specula speculative analysis uh, from anthropological and religious standpoint um, regard to the, the, the birth and origin of, of the alphabets. Okay, so a natural in terms of matter essential uh, origin. Okay, and um, and whichever the case, let's leave it like that. So natural origin as opposed to supernatural, paranatural entity. Um, although the latter term doesn't really make sense uh, because it's not it's not about being above nature or outside of nature. Granted, uh, the divine being God, it's not part of nature in itself in a, in, because it's separate, it creates nature, but it can also be found in nature. So you might assume that it will not be theologically incorrect to say that Neurobiology, for instance, will be accounted for, um, if not in a causal sense, in a very strong um, correlation sense uh, toward the, 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 the development of language itself. And this is connected to, to Broca's, um, Wernicke, for instance, um, as, as well as, you know, to, to Haken, to, to Alexander Luria, uh, Edith Crowley Traeger, many, many, many others uh, within this, this assumption, the development of language from an evolutionary biology perspective. Now, whether this analysis um, the, is connected to the one of, of complex um, linguistic forms, such as uh, indicators, uh, sentences, um, psychological processes, uh, mechanism, priming versus meaning, or, or the observation of neural activities as a correlational activator of semantic sequences and algorithms, the issues here is, is how can we quantify that scientifically speaking? How can we predict something scientifically speaking? Which is, again, the issue of how can we push what we observe to the meaning, the translation of neurological processes into psychological theories okay? um, and, 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 and models that can explain language um, in connection to our sensory uh, apparatus, to auditory uh, stimuli. Now, to give an example, 
think about the serial model by uh, Janet Fodor and Lynn Fraser or the unification model that was proposed by uh, Gerard Kampen and Theo um, Fossum. Now, this is only a, a, a basic analysis of uh, neuro linguistics, um, which in itself contains a semantic analysis of uh, meaning versus value judgments, um, as well as what it means to understand ourselves through language, self knowledge. This is something that um, um, Charles Leslie Stevenson uh, discussed in, in, in examining the cognitive use uh, of language. So, um, our understanding our self-knowledge through communication with other human beings in specific context. Now, um, without getting too much detail here, please review the text with the first pattern analysis focusing on the two parts of ethical statements, the speaker's declaration, i.e. the declaration of the speaker's attitude, and imperative to follow in a specular way, to mimic, to copy, and mirror it. This is extremely important in connection to mirror neurons, to what we said about empathy and uh, pruning and development, both neural development and psychological development in general. Now, cognitive, attentive, or attentional tasks monitoring studies originate from the semantic analysis design. Um, more specifically, because I want to provide some elements here, uh, um, for instance, the probe verification in which a series of sentences is analyzed by presenting the subject with a probe word following each statement. In this type of experimental study, the subject then has to identify the presence of such words in the previously administered sentence. From this perspective, this experimentation um, is akin to acceptability, judgment, task-based research studies, and other types of research areas, for instance, lexical decision tasks using priming studies or research on grammatical acceptability or semantic acceptability shared by linguistics in general, including lexicology and morphology, semantics, syntax, phonetics and phonology, pragmatics, uh, etc., etc., now, you might wonder what scientific methods do we use beside the theoretical analysis here. A theoretical analysis, that it's, it's not less scientific because the analysis of words is extremely important even in, 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 in testing parameters. Think about the big five personality test that it's, it's fully semantic in its origin. You know, the analysis of words and synonym in English language at least. So it's, it's, it's not to say that it's less than um, what we find through neuroimaging, for instance. We measure this multiple times. But if you were to ask, okay, what, what, what about technologies that you, you, are, are used here? Um, um, well, functional near inference spectroscopy might be one of them. Uh, DTI or diffusion tensor imaging that is especially useful to track neural connections between brain areas while the task is performed but also quantitative data in relation to reaction time. Think of the Libet experiment, the acquisition time, decision time, and ordering processing of linguistic patterns by the subject. Now, um, to be more specific here, if, if we uh, ob observe with an EEG a certain pattern of neural activity following a specific task, we can identify discrete values of brain responses. On a computation level, we can calculate, we, uh, we can verify in terms of specific numbers the, the, those, those differences. Now, uh, the common neural responses reflecting semantic processes um, um, are, are, um, are at the center of, of this investigation. So think about ELAN and 400 P600. And just to clarify here, when we mentioned N400, we, we, we mean uh, the, the component of a time-locked EEG signal known as event-related potentials, or ERP. It is a negative going deflection, uh, picking about um, 400 millisecond post-stimulus onset. Okay? So it is part of the normal brain response to, to word or other stimuli, and that's why, why we utilize them in this context. What else? Well, you know, there is stimulation, uh, either direct cortical stimulation or transcranial magnetic stimulations, um, or observing grammar syntax anomalies in the uh, order, disposition, and conceptual structure of words within sentences uh, by providing um, evidential relations for the N400 effect or the P600 response. Think about certain studies by, by Ambig, Osterhau, Kutas, Hilliard, um, and and um, and you know the the, the, the further uh, use of the knowledge gathered by these languages anomalies to 
language acquisition um, in comparison to other techniques, uh, um, electrophysiological techniques, electrocorticography, etc., etc. Maybe um, also um, the, the the observational type of studies um, have to do with with um, what some researchers um, uh, use, and, and they, they will use an artificial uh, experimental disk structure to better investigate working memory and language processing, as well as avoiding bias originating from the subject, over focusing on the experiment itself uh, and stimuli. Because the distraction discount might come from multiple stimuli, to lose a mismatch negativity response, the MMN, or by asking the subject to uh, engage in multiple tasks at once, as is in the case of the double task experiment. Now, uh, the use of neuroimaging techniques in, in, in this context allows for a deeper comparison between language processing and you know, whichever uh, neural underpinnings uh, you find at baseline to monitor area-specific developmental stages, but also to incorporate a broader analysis on pruning, neuroplasticity, the increase in gray and white matter. Uh, and in this context, the, the subtraction, uh, subtraction paradigm focuses exactly on, on such comparison. All right, let's talk uh, about neuroheuristics or neuristics, uh, these two terms that analyze the scientific information on neural activity from within. Adopting a problem-solving framework, including complexity, non-reducibility, deduction, induction, intuition-based debate, and abstract versus extract philosophical speculation, particularly in relation to cognitive examination of decision-making procedures. So, what does neuroheuristics do? Well, they utilize the fundamental data of neurosciences, uh, specifically from neurobiology, to follow a bottom-up process, and again, this is a theoretical bias, um, to understand the structure and function of the central nervous system. So what's one of the challenges to uh, neuroheuristics? Well, it's, it's a very difficult task of monitoring multiple uh, neuroanatomical areas and relay them to what happens outside, to external variables. And uh, we mentioned double heuristics. Um, other terms that are important to keep in mind is uh, are the quantum physics debate, the black box theory. Okay, black box theory connected to the camera obscura, right? F from which the English term camera for uh, DSLR, for instance, um, came from. And um, and um, the the aspect of being um, unaware or being actually, let me rephrase, it, aware of being unaware, okay, these quantitative and qualitative uh, aspects that heuristic understands. So the, the, the lack of knowledge, you could say, that we perceive as human beings. Um, and um, the understanding of, of hermeneutics as, as a para-reflectic uh, understanding is at the center of the debate on the interpretation of medical disorders and is therefore a funding component not only of medicine, but also psychology and bridging fields such as medical humanities or narrative medicine. Think of the work by Maria Giulia Marini, uh, Brian Horvitz, or Tricia Greenbaum. Um, furthermore, we could mention um, the, the understanding of um, uh, heuristics in terms of knowing what we know and better understand our decision-making processes so as we don't encounter mistakes, we account for mistakes, we have um, a predictive power so that we make our sense, ourselves more scientific, our thinking process becomes more scientific. And, and, and the more we know, the more we educate ourselves, the better we will exist, the better we will feel, the less sick we will get eventually. And this is connected to what Plato had to say, uh, especially for the ones of you that um, are enrolled in other uh, courses I teach, specifically the one on, on uh, uh, the scientific method and complementary alternative integrated medicine. Uh, Plato actually defined illness as originating in metaphysical ignorance, right? So the, 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 the connection between being sick in our mind, as in being disoriented, disordered, uh, ignorant um, in our understanding or kind understanding, has a reflection to this lack of balance in our body. And yet again, this mind-body connection is extremely clear. Now, if there is an imbalance of 
cognition, imbalance of mind, and imbalance of spirit, that is an imbalance in the soul. Now, from the perspective of neuroscience, this imbalance deprives the mind-soul from its virtues connected to the absolute truth, being the, and the divine essence. Uh, according to, to this you know, Platonic perspective, now, philosophically understood, the human soul-mind is in constant motion toward becoming more rational, and yet again, mind, spirit, as oriented toward rationality, toward intellect, toward understanding. So, uh, involving awareness and, and consciousness. Now, um, according to this um, rationality component, the rationality as in ratio, we mentioned this, and we mentioned this when we talked about uh, Berin and Hegel again, there is a constant battle of the soul against the influence of evil, which ultimately causes physical and psychical disorders. So um, how can we find balance again? Well, we need to listen to our bodies, and here we, we find you know, the importance of, of solid scientific method, medicine, as well as meditation practices, brain exercises. And what about our mind? What about our intellect? Well, through education, we will get physically and psychologically and spiritually healthy again. Okay? So this type of education, uh, conducting oneself from point A to B, ex ducere, ex ducare, we could say in, in, in Latin, it's actually self-education, not in the sense that you just create education from scratch, you know, by, by virtue of, 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 of imagining things and not uh, pay attention to, to what someone else has to teach you or even life itself has to teach you, but it's self-education because it's the education of the self. Think about what we said about curing the soul, the cura anime, the curatus um, anime. What uh, is important about neuroeconomics? Well, uh, it's important because we're talking about our existence in the world, our behavior, and behavior in this context is interpreted from the perspective of single decision, the decision of the individual, or multiple decisions, um, as well as a single better, worse choice among many options. So, of course, it's connected to um, ethics. Now, in mainstream modern neuroeconomics, the main assumptions follow the ones of contemporary economics, particularly in regard to expected utility, utility maximization, as in Bernoulli, um, logical base of informed and rational agent-based decision, and standardized single currency system models on overall utility values. Now, this is, of course, connected to what we said a few weeks ago regarding the materialist or utilitarianist connection between capitalism and communism and, um, and the really criticism to mainstream um, economic systems. Now, a similar criticism is found in the definition of risk and avoidable or unwanted outcomes and on whether firing rates of individual neurons can be understood under the lens of better choice or decisions to avoid. Uh, and I refer in this context to the bibliography at the end of the textbook, but particularly the studies by Pado Askiopa and Assad on the orbitofrontal cortex of monkeys. As animals, especially humans, make decisions in a social environment, Elements of social neuroscience and psychology or sociology are used in this field uh, to account for the amount of social effects on each decision of series or choices. Now, um, there are several examples here connected to morality, value, judgment. Uh, think of the prisoner's dilemma by Flood and Drescher, uh, where the cost of trust plays a fundamental role in that it determines the level of cooperation between individuals, among individuals. And on the level of neuroeconomics, the increased outcome in terms of spread shared benefit within social cooperation is compared with individual single gain, the gain of the individual, and it's modulated by the presence of oxytocin and the activation of the reward pathways in the central nervous system, uh, more specifically the ventral striatum, as well as the tegmental area in the brain. And, and this provides, yet again, a solid neuroscientific, neurobiological, neuroanatomical and functional perspective to understand how we function, how we reason, how we make choices as human beings. 
So, and how do we know this? Through neuroimaging te uh, technologies, um, because these studies rely on the analysis of blood oxygenation levels as well on the presence or absence or increase, decrease of, of, of specific um, um, chemicals during activation, action function at, at baseline. So you compare any activity with a control activity or you compare average subjects with subjects affected by neurocognitive damage, specifically in the case of behavioral or emotional related areas. I mean, think about the limbic system, particularly the, the amygdala. Um, and, um, and, and so oxytocin in this kind of plays a fundamental role. Um, but we should also mention serotonin in relation to uh, intertemporal uh, choice, um, the expected utility assigned by human subjects to event occurring at different times, as opposed to the assumed uh, constancy, consistency of choice found in discounted utility, the presence of dopamine as well, and increased activation of the dopamine reward pathways in the nucleus accumbens, as well as the uh, B8 area of frontal median cortex, the frontal parietal cortex, and the medial prefrontal uh, cortex for difficult decision-making processes involving um, uncertainties. And, and, and this is very, very important to verify and the difference between baseline and outliers, normal and abnormal behavior. And just to, to mention the, the work by Kahneman and Tsarsky, because it's mentioned throughout economics, uh, the general is tendency to overweight small probabilities and underweight large ones in terms of showing uh, risk-seeking behaviors. Um, and um, the, 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 the neural uh, basis for this, the, um, when, when the balance between sheer uncertainty and risk appears to show heaviness, um, on the latter, as in gaming or, or, or gambling, we notice, interestingly enough, an increased activation of the insular cortex. So these are fascinating fields, um, as, as, as are fascinating the, 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 the other fields uh, to which uh, neuroeconomics connect. So psychology, think about um, Bandura and Michel on, 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 on decision making, think about um, um, the, the, the concept of, 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 of um, immediate and delayed reward. Uh, where, you know, of course, the neural underpinnings appear to be the lateral prefrontal cortex, albeit with a, with a ratio uh, differential. But, that, but to be specific, what, what we know through the research is that the limbic system is generally more activated in the case of impulsive decisions, as you probably expect, while the cortex is more activated in general aspect of intertemporal decision processes. So it's, it's about ratio. The ratio of limbic to cortex activation decreased as a function of the amount of time passed until the reward, regardless if the reward is actually obtained or is perceived as such. And this will also explain the activation of other chemical components, particularly hormones and neurotransmitters, as well as the production of uh, stress-related uh, chemicals, cortisol, and activation, the activation of, uh, of stress response, which is in turn extremely important in when talking about um, uh, addiction in general, drug addiction more specifically. So this is a fascinating field that um, uh, is part of neuroscience as a whole. Let's talk about artificial intelligence briefly, I dare to say, because um, I, I refer to the research studies uh, presented as part of the bibliographic or um, um, direction in, in this textbook, starting by understanding the term. So we talked about intelligence multiple times, so just a brief review here. What do we mean by artificial? Well, it comes from, as usual, the Latin artificialis, or artificialis, depending if you use the, 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 the current pronunciation or, or the archaic one, or the, the, the ecclesiastical church pronunciation, the Italian pronunciation as opposed to the uh, traditional um, um, pronunciation. So artificial as made with or made by or made out of art, art as in techne, so something that you create. So something that is artificial, so produced by human beings rather than occurring naturally. So usually this means by copying or imitating something natural. That's at least how artificial uh, came to be in English language. So um, what, what do we mean by that? Well, we could mean things such as computer brain interface and, and, and things that connect our knowledge of our human brain-based processes to the application of such processes in informatics, for instance. Okay, so comprehension and perception, capacity for logic, learning, planning, creativity, and problem solving. 
um, a, as far as human um, processes. Now, the, the, the main problem in identifying perception has to do with the connection with the self, so self-awareness, um, self-perception, self um, and the connection to, to what we know about human intelligence, how we can read between these lines. Um, and, and, and so at the center of the development of artificial intelligence technologies, we find indeed pattern recognition, for instance, the ability to recognize facial expressions on one side and familiar faces on the other. This is a particular feature of human beings, as you already know, think about uh, prosopagnosia in this context, but also the study of communication, language understanding, speech production, uh, concept formation. And, 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 and the ability to read again between the lines, think about the theory of multiple intelligences by Gardner. So these eight main abilities, right, uh, as basis for related intelligence, the linguistic, the logical, mathematical, the spatial, the musical, the bodily, the kinesthetic, the interpersonal and intrapersonal, um, as well as the, um, um, the intelligence compensation theory, the ICT by Wood and Angard, or, or uh, the investment theory based on the kettlehorn carroll theory, the LI effect or latent inhibition by Lyubov and more, the Pareto frontal integration theory of intelligence, um, Jean Piaget talking about uh, developmental psychology, the, the PASS or PASS theory of intelligence by Luria, the process personal intelligent knowledge theory, uh, the triarchy theory of intelligence by Sturmrings, and, and many, many, many others. In discussing sense, purpose, and meaning, uh, the textbook does not propose a final uh, solution of the mind-body problem, uh, because this final uh, has to do with uh, either termination or end of a process, but also with uh, some types of, of, of goal, function, as well as boundary, perimeter, which really is connected to sense, purpose, of, and meaning because it's it's about d defining something and this defining has to do with finis right with the boundary the perimeter and it's a definition that varies from individual to individual subjectively and personally so we could argue that there can be multiple solutions to the mind body problems in fact as many solutions as there are individuals or even more, as there are perspectives of viewpoints or, or, or traits, even personalities within each individual. But we have to figure out whether whether this is actually a good approach or not, because uh, aside from the fact that there might be more than one individual, think about what we said about uh, corpus callosotomy, or that there might be some transcendental elements, we, we mentioned this multiple times, the diabolane versus symbolane, the diabolic component, this split black and white component, the diabolus, right, versus the symbolic uh, possession and interpretation, right? Um, so uh, how to phrase this, how to understand uh, the sense, purpose, and meaning? Well, by using a relatively relativistic view, okay, um, according to which um, there are philosophical positions and worldviews that might have certain neural underpinnings and vice versa, neural underpinnings that pres presuppose um, philosophical positions. Now, um, so this is really expanding philosophy to philosophy itself and neuroscience to neuroscience itself. So what do we mean by relatively relativistic? Well, um, an individual might embrace a certain stance on the mind-body problem or the heart problem of consciousness exactly because a certain state of mind in an individual's brain. Okay? So um, this does not mean that this state of mind is necessarily caused by the brain, but the very fact that there is a certain state of mind in a person might push, so to speak, the person to embrace this or that philosophical element. But this is also true for the vice versa perspective that working on certain philosophical elements, which you could say have to do with working on um, uh, an intellectual development, not just a cognitive development, but also a spiritual development, since we mentioned a thousand times at this point, the connection between the spirit and the intellect, the spiritual self and the rational self. So if you develop that, then your brain will change accordingly. We do know this through neuroplasticity and think about meditation and prayer and and, 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 and uh, integrate practices. And we can verify this in terms of everything we say so far about how we process information. Okay. So um, this could be viewed as going beyond uh, double hermeneutics 
and going to a triple hermeneutics, which is necessary for the THTS, the triple S model. So triple hermeneutics for triple S model self soul and spirit, THTS. Again, this connection to the uh, sense of divinitat is what we said about planting, uh, for instance, the relation between um, uh, sin, for instance, lack of, of processes and mental disorder. Now, the application of nature versus nurture, mutual influence, mind over matter versus matter of their mind, would, however, not necessarily lead to the dismissal of any absolute or universal truth. Okay, so the fact that we're using this relatively relativistic perspective does not mean that we we are embracing relativism in understanding mind-body uh, connection. But it will actually lead to the realization that there are ulterior perceptual modalities, the content of which can only be understood with a different mindset, a different state of mind, ultimately a different state of consciousness. Now, is this our opinion? Of course, it's discussed that in, in the textbook, but it's an applied opinion to evaluate the evidence of the existence of these states, of multiple modalities of perceiving, of understanding, and ultimately of being, and of a non-physically based, matter-based form of mind, soul, and spirit. So in other words, there is more to our brain than our body alone. We are more than just our bodies as human beings. We do indeed have a soul and a spirit. Okay? Now, we're talking about opinions here, but keep in mind that opinion is connected to the Latin or Italian opinare. The term opinare indicates literally touching, reaching, and creating. So it's really empirically based in this sense. It's very scientific. We're not, we're not pushing to say that anybody's opinion is a scientific fact. Of course not. But if we are internally balanced, then our opinions will be informed by this balance. So opinion from opinare. Okay, so touching with the eye, reaching with the eye, creating with the eye. It's a Sanskrit root op um, um, and, and, and connect to uh, a perception to grasping, to seeing, right? Conceptualizing, right? Begriff, greifen in German. And it's also touching with the mind, reaching with the mind, creating with the mind. Think of the central root up this time, not op, so OP versus AP, found in opus or opera. So our perception actually is our opinion. If our perceptual modalities are intact, our senses, inner senses, intuitive senses, spiritual sense, the sense of divinitatis is intact, then our opinion will be universal, will be intact. Okay, So we should not try to eliminate our subjectivity in reaching a more objective understanding of the mind-body uh, problem, the same way as we should not try to eliminate the place effect in reaching a more universal healing method. So this is definitely not a postmodernist position that re rejects anything absolute and absolutely everything, okay? But possibly the opposite. Uh, some could even argue that our position toward the mind-body uh, problem, the mind-body connection, is really traditional with a capital T, okay? Um, that understands that subjective experience as primary pathway to reach absolute universal truth. It's finding infinite doors to an incredibly vast room beyond. Um, and, and, and this is because we're trying to find balance within ourselves and within the world. Again, we are not of the world, we are in the world. Okay, And, and this happens because, philosophically speaking, in terms of society, everything changes. So sometimes this position might be categorized as being on the right end of the socio-political spectrum. Sometimes it will be categorized as being on the left of the socio-cultural political spectrum. But according to a balance, balance is by definition at the center, which is exactly at the, at the core of our um, connection between mind and body. The purpose of studying it is to find this uh, this, this this spiritual balance, we could say, because if things are not in balance, that we 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 fall prey of the the the, the, the caducity, the fallacy of, of of human nature. Okay, the the decadent in the in the way decadent as um, as a term is utilized outside of the English um, 
um, linguistic sphere, so something that is falling apart. Think about uh, Stanley Milgram experiment, the, 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 obedience, the, the obedience experiments, and, and the, 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 the connection between authority and obedience to unethical, immoral, uh, and hostile behavior. Um, and, and, and the connection with, with um, type A and type B, when we talk about um, personality, right? Not, not cluster A, B, and C um, of personality disorders or personality A, B, C, and D, but type A versus type B in terms of the connection between empathy and balance as opposed to aggression and, 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 and anger, okay? Now, so how do we find these ethical standards, this, this basis? Well, through ourselves as well as from, from above. Now, the connection from above is its connection to uh, the legal aspect, the social aspects. Um, but but the, the fact that there, there has to be freedom of understanding, um, because anyone, talking about this lack of morality, this experiment, anyone can commit wrongful acts if under pressure or coercion, under perceived or real authority, or they made to believe they are doing the right thing. And that's the issue with, with an imbalance, uh, freedom from freedom itself. We might think that we might be freedom, free, but in, in the end, we, we actually uh, help captives and the connection with captivos and bad was already examined in previous weeks, okay? Uh, and, 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 and there's a further connection, a connection with, with, with uh, literary masterpieces. Think of the banality of evil by Arendt or the evil of banality by, by Binich. So, um, or, or the whole discussion on, 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 on uh, quote-unquote um, bad philosophies that the, the Sartre and Camus, even them, warn us against, right? Uh, the bad philosophy as philosophy that that promote the full abandonment of reason, rationality, or, or rational methods, right? Because if you find this balance, your mind and body connection will give you the best of both worlds. You will perceive in a spiritual sense, but you have a strong scientific understanding, okay? So, and, and even if you want to take a very simple uh, aspect uh, to, 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 to this interpretation, Sartre and Camus, uh, since men, human beings, are responsible for what, what, what man is, and at the same time, man is responsible for other human beings, he, man, always chooses the better for himself and therefore for humanity because we come from the same core. And this is, it's, it's a fascinating thing to, to, uh, to keep in mind. So... Where, where does those rules come from? What is this aboveness? Does it come from our, our biological perspective or from our body? Or does it come from our mind? Well, the aboveness of, of human ethics, knowing what we should do, can also be aboveness from a higher, more profound sphere, a, 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 a sphere of light, of spirituality, right? Um, a, 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 um, an, an entity which communicates with us through us because we as human beings are made of the same, I dare to use the term divine light, right? Um, so something is communicated with us through us, again, revelation revealed to us, discovered, okay? More specifically to the complex apparatus of mind-body processes to create a, uh, an experience both objective and subjective. It's a mind-body experience and therefore a mind-body evidence. We know it to be true because we experience it as true and therefore it appears to us as true. We have evidence of the truth. It, it's an experience that has to be fully integrated, right? So um, the, the, the mind-body problem provided both experience and evidence in ontological and practical terms because we are able to connect the multiple aspects of ourselves and everything comes together. This concludes week 14, the very last lecture uh, for this semester. I hope you enjoyed the discussion uh, and I am looking forward to see your comments uh, as part of the uh, system discussion in this uh, very last module. Next week, week 15, we will be preparing ourselves for the final exam. I just want to thank all of you for a wonderful semester, for your attention, your enthusiasm, and your passion for all the topics that we have the opportunity to discuss. Uh, thank you very much, and until next time, bye-bye.